You know, the next thing I wanted to talk about is the affidavit support requirement, a special nuanced version of it. So just some background, if we're going to do a family-based immigration case where you're applying for siblings, parents, children, all that kind of stuff, um, there's going to be a part where you need to file an affidavit of support to say you're financially going to support that foreign person who's going to get a green card, their family. Uh, and sometimes if you're the petitioner, or the main person requesting it or the foreign family member doesn't make enough money, you might get a, a joint sponsor or a household member uh, from I-64A in that case um, to submit it. And then what happens, sometimes families have falling outs, they have divorces, and they're like, well, I don't want to support this person anymore. I don't want to be on the hook because the FBA support means that if they go to the hospital, the hospital could ask you for the money. If they get food stamps or things they're not supposed to get because of their status, they could come after you and get the money. So there's a lot of financial consequences that could happen. The foreign person could even sue the bus sponsor and say, listen, you need to pay me $2,000, $3,000 a month according to the I-6 that you signed. There's a lot of financial responsibilities, rarely ever does come down to it, but it happens and we get these calls and, you know, the divorce context is where it comes out. People start hating each other and they don't want to do it. And Anya, so Anya, what, what is the requirement of the affidavit support in the sense that um, when could you get out of it and how could you get out of it? Well, um, this is the contract, right? Yeah. Contract between the sponsor and, uh, and the government. US exactly. government, yeah. right? Saying that the sponsor will take all the financial responsibility for the intended immigrant, right? And um, there, there are a couple of ways that sponsor can get out. For example, when the uh, immigrant becomes a US citizen, mm -hmm. this is the first thing, right? If the, uh, the immigrant died, so of course, understandably, right? If, uh, if a person is no longer a permanent resident and they lost this permanent resident status, mm -hmm. right? If uh, um, if they work if for like forty credits or quarters 40 or something like that, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Which is years, then I can't remember ten years, right? Yeah, something years. like that. Something like that. Yes, and they have enough of this like social security payments that they made during this time, yeah. All right? And there is one more thing um, about removal proceedings, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, they've been found remove and lose a green card status. So as you yeah. said, like that, the, this is a contract with the U.S. government. So it's not like it, 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 they won't back out of the contract. It's not with the foreign person for their support. So there's there's no way out of it. But the, the thing is, when you mentioned the first one, when the foreign person becomes a citizen, this is incentive because people sometimes in these contexts, they really start hating each other and they don't want to help. But sometimes like, listen, help the person get their citizenship. The sooner they get the citizenship, the sooner that your responsibilities go away. So trying to make it more difficult for them to keep their green card sometimes can work against you because they'll keep their green card and they can force you to get more money, go to school, go to court, even sue you and get that money. Right. So there is no really such a thing as withdrawal. You cannot withdraw this application, yeah. this form, right? You cannot, yeah. unless, as I said, the person became a U.S. citizen or they lost their status and so on. Right. There is no such a thing as just withdrawal. So once yeah, you I mean, at most, really if hope. they just sent it in, the case is still pending, maybe they could pull it out. But once the person's green card is issued, that's yeah. done. The contract is settled and you're on the hook for the I-64 after the support. Yes, very important, very important thing. That's right. Before before the case uh, is not done yet, yes, you might still do something with it. But once the person receives the green card, um, that's it. it. Well, thank you so much, Anya. This is the thing. All these issues that we talk about today uh, pop up all the time. People call us all the time um, where they're like, I don't want to be part of this. Or they want to know what the responsibilities are of the joint sponsor because their friend or relative said, hey, could you do this? And they're kind of worried about it. Now, typically, these problems don't happen and no, nobody ever gets needs to pay out or anything for the affidavit of support. But, you know, it's life. There's a million people getting green cards every year. I think what half of them at least are family cases. So statistically, this stuff does come up. Uh, so it's good to go with your open eyes. Now, if some, if you know, if my sister married somebody and she wanted me to be a finance support, I'd probably do it just because it's you know sort of my sister. But sometimes you know relationships are always different in different families and different friendships. Um, but uh, it's good to know what the facts are. Yes, I did thank you so much. Go ahead. Yes, uh, I have a question. So you mentioned that um, the uh, mm -hmm. immigrant can potentially sue the sponsor. To provide like financial support under this um, under the affidavit of support, is this like yeah. really the case? 
Yeah, there's a there's an attorney actually in Washington State that's most of his business immigration is is doing these lawsuits because when the sponsors won't pay up, they go to court and they get an order that forces them to pay up under this contract. So it's like civil litigation, and there's not much case law. Is it, is it is governments? Is this like they're suing each other? Because I understand again, this is the contract between the government and the sponsor. Right? Yeah. So how the immigrant can potentially sue the sponsor under the circumstances? You no, know, it, it goes to state law, and I, I haven't done the lawsuits, but um, I, I think it would be something like they're the beneficiary of this, so they have like a, a their party at stake, and they can force it because uh, they said they're going to support this person for this amount of money, and they're on the hook for you know if, like if you just marry somebody, you know twenty two thousand maybe three hundred dollars a month or something like that. So just go to state court and they sue on it. And it's an easy win for the most part because there have been cases where people appeal. They say, you know, my spouse was cheating on me or the, they only married me because they want to get a green card. And the judges are like, no, it's this is it. We don't believe that unless USCIS, I guess, pulls a fraud statute and, and, and you know, takes away. Um, that they, they sue all the time. Uh, I think uh, who's the, the person He's in Washington State. Uh, he does a lot of litigation on this. It's like his main practice area. Uh, but they win frequently. Uh, and. Uh, even appeals that have happened to next level appeals, the courts have said, yeah, um, this is it. Now, they, they could be, you know, higher end federal uh, appeals that happen that kind of get their case law on this. But for the most part, that's it. You soon you get it. So you, they get like basically some kind of alimony or something like that, right? Under, under and, Yes, an additional alimony. Now, some people in, in their prenup agreement say, well, if I have to pay this, then you, you cancel it out. Um, you know, there's just not enough litigation and, and public litigation. That they probably settle this kind of stuff. Uh, for us to know exactly how the works out, so the actual case law and court work for it is not fully clear. But there are a lot of you know first level cases where people sue and they get it. It's pretty consistent that they get it. Um, but whether prenuptial agreements could fully get you out of it, because like there's two things. One is you're going to support the foreign person and give them money on a continuous basis. That's one aspect. But there's the contract of the government, which is like I went to the hospital, it cost fifty thousand dollars. Somebody's got to pay for it. That's you can't get out of, you know. But so there's like two aspects to that 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 come with it. Um, so you can't, you know, sign a prenuptial agreement. Maybe you can sign an agreement with the spouse that says if I have to pay for you for the advocate support, you'll you'll indemnify me, pay me back. Um, there just haven't been case law where I, that I can see where it's actually happened. People went to court, so we don't really know how this works out. They probably always settle out of court uh, to, to avoid all the lawyers' costs because that's going to cost a bunch of money going to court about this. But um, it is an area that's kind of been flux and unknown. Other than you probably can't get it if you need it. Yeah, this is a very interesting point to know. So once uh, you sign an affidavit of support, right? Not only yeah. government can uh, can uh, come after you, right? But your, for example, your spouse or the one who you who you're signing these papers for. So. Exactly, whoever you sponsored could, could get it. So it's just you know, buyer beware, signer beware that these responses come. With our firm, when we have sponsors and joint sponsors. It's in our contract and these releases that that specify what these responsibilities are. So people go in with their eyes open. There's no surprises. Last thing we want a couple of years from now, someone say, hey, you didn't tell me this. I'm like, no, you did. We, we had this release. So you went in fully aware. And usually, you know, it sounds kind of scary, but people do it. It's very rarely a problem. But again, it could pop up. Yes. And uh, one last thing that I want to mention, the affidavits of support asks uh, about the household size, right? Yeah. And in this household size, if you... Uh, sponsored someone previously you need to if this person is still a local permanent resident and didn't become a uh, u.s citizen yet right uh, you, you yeah. need to put them in this uh in the future affidavit of supports so. yeah that's kind of really important uh we had a case recently where a guy sponsored a spouse and they got divorced and he sponsored a new spouse and we're like well what happened is this the, you know the family size is going to be bigger and it's required more income he, he barely made it but he's like, no, no, my, my previous spouse got her citizenship. She's a citizen now. So, okay, household size was smaller. So the minimum amount of money they need to make uh, to do a after support was, was, was good. So that fixed it up.